Uh, you may have read our first book, which was like permaculture on the road. How do, how do you move around with permaculture principles? And I'll just back up a little bit more and just talk quickly about the kind of ethics or principles of permaculture. It was a book called Permaculture One, released in 1978. And it was really trying to look at perennial agricultural systems. The young student, David Hongren, and teacher, Bill Mollison, um, were really trying to think through these big problems, uh, particularly looking at how oil is the main ingredient in uh, the in conventional agriculture or in what has become known as big ag. And, and of course, the other probably three main ingredients are superphosphates and uh, sugar uh, and glyphosate. And so all four of those main ingredients in the, uh, in the conventional food bowl uh, are really doing a lot of damage um, to biomes, uh, to the biosphere generally, uh, in terms of desertification or deforestation uh, sugar being uh, sugar plantations or mono monocultural sugar crops being great uh, destroyers of ecology for a food that we should be eating quite a lot less of. Uh, you could argue also um, uh, the commercial meat industry is also a big problem. Uh, if any of you have been following the, the unfolding glyphosate story, just a yet another example of Technofix uh, feed the world ideology um, ending up in a disaster for many people, uh, whether it be Indian farmers suiciding because their crops have failed and they're so indebted to Monsanto that they face great shame and bankruptcy, or whether it actually be um, cancer, uh, the carcinogenic uh, unfolding story, of which you know there has been 30 years of warnings about such things as glyphosate and, and about what um, monocultural sugar crops are doing and what, what oil uh, how much oil is required in every aspect of our food, um, and just what a, a massive, uh, uh, I guess, story of climate transformation is the way in which we move around the planet uh, energetically and make our food. So food and energy resources, I guess, are the things of which uh, myself and my partner Meg um, and many friends have looked at as two things that you could possibly do something with in the household and community economies. We don't have so much power to do something about uh, the big uh, geopolitical uh, institutions of the world that are driving uh, a big extractive economy. We don't have really much uh, political agency in uh, properly acknowledging and um, addressing or redressing the issue of uh, indigenous sovereignty and terra nullius and the fact that our country is, is um, built upon that great lie which all of our rental agreements and mortgages are tapped into. Um, but so while we are all subjects of and actors of the great imperialist economy, that I think 68 or 68 people, mainly men, own more than half of the world's wealth. That's how it's. That's how extreme it has become. We do have agency in our homes to determine and transform two big capital areas, and that is food and energy. And so slowly, bit by bit, I guess our household story, as respondents to the predicament of our time, is uh, very much in, involved in step-by-step -step redressing of how, OK, we have land tenure uh, on Aboriginal land, whether a rental agreement or a mortgage, we have that land tenure. That is deeply problematic. There are things that we are, are doing to acknowledge that and relationships forming to address that. However, what we can actually do is uh, divest from big corporate systems of energy and divest from big corporate systems of food. And, and of course, the third trifecta in that, and I realised what a trifecta this was, riding our bikes into central, Victoria, uh, central Queensland after months and months on the road, and coming across this great mirage. I think it was Shell, Coles, 
and Priceline Pharmaceuticals or some big Kenmart or something like that. And I thought, wow, on the edge of this town, it was just this mirage, this American-style super conglomerate where you go for your petrol needs, you go for your food needs. And of course, if you're using industrial transits and eating industrial food, you definitely need industrial medicine <laughs> because those two things, those first two things are going to make you sick through passivity of body uh, and through the in innutritious diet that um, supermarket foods sell, are, uh, are offering up. And that's not just in the junk food aisles, that's across all the aisles. Uh, really, the story is how do we attend to those two big systems and, and decouple the corporate power in our food and energy systems? And what we've found, so while that was the political motivation to begin with, uh, lots of anxiety around that, what we've found is that actually it's just simply a better way to live. Uh, it's a better way to live in a spiritual sense, it's a better way to live in a microbiome sense or a human health sense, and then the impacts on the local environment uh, have benefits as well. And that what we've found is that instead of, you know, really sort of being anxiously uh, trying to uh, push away those big corporate um, psychopathic structures uh, of money, we've actually found... Uh, well, for me personally, um, I, I, I was raised religious. Uh, I moved away in my university years into an atheism, uh, materialism, I suppose. And what I've actually found is that the religious experience is nothing all that mystical. It's actually just the body in relationship with the earth, making economy and making relationships in order to make economy. And so um, I feel like that has become the bigger story. And, and while environmentalists uh, like myself stand and rant and rave about the big power structures and the big bad men of history, um, really this is a story of intimacy and relationships and relating at, in the household and community economies and that those economies become economies of, of a flow of gifts, what I call a flow of gifts with other humans but also with more than humans. Um, and I think, you know, what better... Uh, I can't think of a better return of gifts than recycling our human waste. And as a gardener, I have become exceptionally... Like, I, I've started my gardening life as a what I call a fecophobe, and now I would say I'm a fecophile. Um, I'm simply in love with human shit. And I feel like, uh, I think the story uh, of Nauru is really pertinent to this because we are at um, peak phosphate rock. And so that was the, another one of the ingredients in sugar, oil, glyphosate, and phos phosphate rock. And phosphor phosphate rock, which um, is required to make superphosphates uh, in order for those beautiful green, lush, uh, crops and grass to, to grow cows is what you see in like desert areas of Australia and you say how is that so green well it's it's a it's a synthetic fertilizer that's come from ancient bird shit uh, and Nauru is the is a is a really uh, good case in point because their whole economy throughout the later part of the 20th century was based on uh, very old bird poo uh, built up over millennia and within 50 years, or even less, uh, they had sold it all off. And in fact, in Melbourne, there's the Nauru House with the great sculpture out f f the front of the, of, the, of the ancient bird poo. And, what, and what's so tragic about that, and, and I'll just digress a little more, the last of their money in their kind of Ponzi uh, economy, um, uh, as, as industrial agriculture just is scraping you know, the last of ancient bird poo so required to, to, to keep making cheap food in our supermarkets is that Nauru invested the last bit of money in a Broadway show that flopped in New York. It's a really incredible story. Um, I don't even think it went for a week. It might it not have even got to, to opening night, but that's how tragic that is for their people. And now they are, instead of dealing in ancient bird shit, they're dealing in human waste in the form of being selling their land as a jail to the Australian government. So these are the sorts of stories of 
uh, shocking stories are, are testaments to the big um, industrial paradigm, but what happens when we actually start dealing with our own shit? It's, it's like it's confronting because we've grown up basically flushing it away and never seeing it again. And that's very uh, sophisticated and very sort of um, going into an affluent ascending world that is very, uh, that's pretty cool. That's pretty, like, we've we all, well, I remember growing up in the 70s, never hearing, um, even though my parents were kind of back to the landers, there was no way that we had, there were compost toilets around. It was very much, you, you get rid of it and you never think of it. So, um, Th that, so the story of processing our own shit is actually, to, to quote uh, the, the writer um, Donna Haraway, is actually staying with our trouble. It's actually saying we, we are human creatures. We're, we're animals that uh, consume and we make returns. And when, before we became city makers, um, our shit was highly valued in an ecological system, just like any other creature. It was spread out. Leaves would, uh, in, a, in a forest or grassland scenario, it would become a part of the humus. It would be giving back. And uh, life is based on humus, uh, on, on that sort of between 100 and 200, maybe 300 mil of, of soil. That is all life, uh, especially human life, being based on agricultural productions, uh, that is essential. Um, and so uh, for us to sort of obfuscate our responsibility to our, to our waste is a, a denial of us as creatures that can make returns, that can put back as well as take from. And so I think um, making returns is probably, for Meg and I, a very big focus um, in a, in, a, in a culture that is either based on progressiveness on the left or progress on the right. And both of them are talking about a linearity. They're talking about a linear story, progress, progressiveness. Um, whereas uh, most of human history, uh, with our culture making has been based on making the return. And so it's been in sync with ecosystems because we have understood that energy uh, taken, it, it, it goes somewhere else. And in, in that going somewhere else, um, there is new life to follow. So that life is, uh, follows birth, growth, consumption, death, decay, renewal. And so that's a regenerative, uh, that's a regenerative uh, cycling of economy. And that's why I would say for most of human history, we have lived within ecological economies. And it's only really um, probably in the last 300 years that that has been severely corrupted, but particularly in the last century and particularly in the last 30 years. Uh, and we have got so far away from our indigenous and peasant ancestors and their sensibilities to understanding, not in the way that we understand, but in, in, a, in a certainly understanding that returns need to be made. And that's why most cultures of place have uh, rituals around sacrifice or honouring or giving back to, and things that we, you know, in many respects can't understand or appreciate or, how, you know, or you know, turn our nose at because it seems extreme. But most cultures honour the earth back. And the mother um, being the terra, uh, the terra firma of which springs all life from that humus layer, is um, before I, I say that the, the imperialist genie was out of the bottle, the mother was honoured and in varying different ways. Um, and I would say also, this is a gross generalisation, but I'd say most cultures before 5,000 years were gender distributed. That often the female realm was the shamanic, the healing, uh, the medicine, because uh, generally throughout traditional cultures, uh, women 
had the plant knowledges and fungi knowledges. Um, and so while you might have in Crete, for example, the, um, the king line is, or the governing line is male, the priestess line is female. And that still reverberates today. And why Crete is one of the safest places to bring up children left in the Western world is because of that gender distributed remnant. Uh, it still exists. And so um, the, the sort of the lopsided patriarchal destructiveness of, of a male uh, economic system that is extractive only and not giving back to the mother is the kind of, from my mind, the paradigm so, uh, that, we're, that we're living within. So, so for me, composting our human waste uh, in a very, if you understand the biology of composting human waste, it is extremely safe. It needs uh, uh, human manure or human manure requires um, immediate microbial life, carbon inputs. It needs ecology. Uh, we use comfrey leaves, uh, human manure, uh, sawdust waste from a, a nearby uh, furniture maker or um, mill, local sawmill, um, and we use tiger worms, which are a compost worm that everything that passes through their gut is pretty much sanitized. And you end up within a very short period of time, six to nine months, uh, an incredible substrate for growing food. And we, when we started off, we would bury it in the garden. We, we, we dug long drops and just sort of did what national parks do. Uh, then we got a little bit more, whoa, this isn't so bad. Um, uh, then we thought, well, we, we'll put it on the perennial garden, so just the fruit trees and not the annuals. And then uh, a few years ago, maybe three years ago, we started growing our annual vegetables in it. And all the time building a confidence, an intuitive confidence, that what we are doing, um, by taking this already pre-digested material, when you, when you actually uh, compost, say, Scrap uh, from scraps from the kitchen, they haven't gone through an amazing gut. And so you've got uh, a pre digested material, and you only need one part nitrogen to about 25 or 30 parts carbon. And then the other things like the worms and the comfrey, and the other th like you can activate biochar with your urine and crush charcoal or something like that. So these are all like building a relationship with the body again, as, 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 and the body being an intelligent biome that knows how to process its own waste and gives a product that's actually really useful to the rest of life. And so what we call closing the poop loop is, um, <laughs> is, uh, is you know, something that we take rather religiously. I mean, you know, I use that word a bit flippantly there, but it is, it, it, there is something very sacred about that. And um, certainly the soils that we produce, which produce the next lot of vegetables that are going to be either fermented as probiotic medicine or, or, or cooked or eaten raw as a pre, uh, uh, prebiotic fiber for the gut. So like the comfrey is to the human neuro compost, as a fiber for beneficial microbes and as an activator. Um, a, a great diverse range of uh, fermented and um, fibrous vegetables are really what we call preventative medicine. We have very little need. Uh, in fact, I can't remember the last time our family has been to a chemist. Um, and it's not like we're against, we're, we're, we're very thankful that mechanistic medicine exists. I've put a chainsaw in my leg and I was really thankful I could go to emergency and have it stitched up. And I've been really thankful when I've been critic, critically ill that I have had a course of antibiotics. But in our house, uh, no one's had any antibiotics for probably five years. And we're using sharp, 
implements all the time in terms of knives, axes. Our six-year-old, as you see, you know, was pretty flippant with that knife. <laughs> He's been using a knife since he was three years old when we perceived that he was ready to have his nice knife license. There is uh, certainly risk and danger um, and experimentation, um, which can potentially uh, throw up some, you know, some issues, and but potentially we may need the the conventional um, medical system. But um, and we're still reasonably young. But the other thing too is that we're also preparing for older age in terms of like all our toilets are squat toilets, for example. So what we've found uh, that almost every technology that has been produced in the last 300 years has an adverse effect that stimulates industries to propel the next technological revolution. And so it's, I think Naomi Klein once described it as disaster capitalism. You bank on, you cre create disaster in order to create more and more industry and more jobs, etc. And so what, so technological, a technological advancement will basically be replacing the last disastrous technological outcomes, but it's very rarely reported like that. When point of contact explorers wrote of Aboriginal health um, from 1788 onwards, one of the things they continued to say was, and of course written up in quite racist terms, but the subtext is basically had remarkable teeth. And here's a bunch of, you know, peasants or post-peasants or convicts and soldiers and some free settlers coming to a country with malnutrition, uh, terrible teeth, um, and chronic uh, substance uh, over, over use of, of various substances like uh, hard liquors and uh, sugar and flour. And so Dr. Beth Gott from Monash University has spent her lifetime, I think she's in her early 90s now, has spent a lifetime looking at Victorian uh, indigenous health um, on point of contact, but also continuing uh, through into the modern era. And so I think, you know, within just a couple of hundred years, uh, you know, that while it, it, it's very well reported, the indigenous health crisis in Australia, um, what, what often isn't uh, understood is just how government stores in Aboriginal communities, particularly remote communities, are selling five litre buckets of white sugar uh, and similar sorts of size jumbo packets of white flour. Um, and yet the families that are doing the best in those communities are the ones that are enacting a very diverse, more traditional range of foods. So that's the sort of thing that we're doing as well. Like while I'm not, uh, I'm not romanticizing my English, Scottish, French, uh, Norman, uh, Irish ancestors uh, were eating this beautiful ferment, <laughs> you know, fermented, uh, beautiful spelt um, sourdoughs, and I'm not romanticizing that at all, but there, there was certainly a great seasonal uh, and working with what's on hand, and certainly wild foods were a part of that. And I think one of the things that um, uh, that we're really conscious of is, uh, and what is little known about the microbiome is that it's connected to our skin microbiome, our gut microbiomes, our mouth microbiomes, and our skin microbiomes are all speaking uh, to one another. It's pretty much, um, uh, from what we know, augmented from the gut. So the enteric system or the enteric nervous system is the organizer of all the other bodily systems. Um, but the skin microbiome, so what we touch and handle, actually those microbes make their way into our guts. And so if you think of touching mosses and rocks and soil and non-contaminated environments all day, then um, and, and handling different mushrooms and different weed species or wild plant species and a, and a plethora of different fruits and vegetables then, uh, that are in season, then you're getting a direct feedback between your environment and your gut. And there's uh, health implications for that. People that live within the seasons and live within their terror, their soil, 
and their relationship to that soil. I think uh, the French always stay, say, still in an industrial culture, they say if you've got issues with um, hay fever, always be eating the local honey. There is so much we don't know about how we intersect as, a, as walking microbial biomes. I think we do know, though, that there are more non-human cells on our body than there are human. Um, that's the latest science. So therefore, and our gut is predominantly non-human. So our whole sort of, if that is augmenting our nervous system, we are actually being augmented by more than human consciousness or a more than human activity. Now, I find that really amazing, but it's actually not that amazing when you start to think of how human beings have interacted and had a connection to their local environment and have been at one with it through food procurement and economy making, whereas today we're so divorced, we don't even know, we wouldn't have a clue where the, the, the milk that's gone into the cheese that we're having or the, you know, the breakfast cereal that, that we're having for breakfast. We would have no idea where that came from and possibly it came from many parts of the world. Um, so I guess uh, I'm really keen to go to your questions, but I guess the, the point of tonight is, to, is really just to, to speak of the possibility of connecting uh, through food. So yeah, just, just in terms of how possible it is to live, in, in a, to live uh, within modernity's realm, but not to uh, uh, be compliant to all of its uh, imperialisms. I'd like to start and say, how much food would you produce um, on your quarter acre block? Mm -hmm. And like, what percentage would that make of your diet? Uh, yeah, with including wild foraging and yeah. snaring of rabbits and eating redfin um, and all the stuff we grow, it's about 55 to 60 percent. Yeah. yeah. In that, there's a lot of gift exchange between other families. So instead of the idea of self-sufficiency, it's community sufficiency. So we might be really good at growing carrots and another household might be really good at growing leeks or something like that. I mean, you know, um, it's that sort of thing. And therefore, we've got different things to exchange all the time. Another sidetrack. Um, when we sit down for a dinner, we always point to the origins of the food. And if we haven't grown it, the people who have grown it. And also, if there is any, we don't eat much animal product. Um, I mean, we do eat dairy and eggs, but we don't eat m much meat. But there's always an acknowledging of the animals. Uh, of, this, of, of all the different inputs. And I think that keeps us and our kids really conscious and our friends and guests really conscious that when we know the story of where our food comes from, we can be much more accountable to it. And so our, our aim is not to be self-sufficient, it's to be community sufficient. So local farmers, uh, there's several local uh, small market garden, garden growers that we have relationships and friendships with. So we, we buy it at the local Sunday farmer's market. Um, and then there's lots of swapping. But 70% of our income is non-monetary now. So 10 years ago, it was 100% monetary reliant. Now it's just 30%. So. What do you use for pesticides? What are the insects that you Yeah. So ecology. So we grow our vegetables in dynamic. Uh, so around our vegetables are what we call a food forest with many different companion plants. Things like nasturtium and calendula are just very well known flowers that attract beneficial predators that eat pests. So it's uh, organic principles. Um, we will, uh, if we have cabbage moth, we will capture some, uh, make a paste uh, and then spray it onto the, the plants. So um, it's usually, it's those sorts of processes. With weeds, uh, because all weed species go, uh, go to disturbed soil because they're pioneer species, they are generally come up in a, I, I like to use the example that a, a baby's saliva will inform the nipple of the mother what constitute what uh, what is required of the milk it's a it's a direct feedback loop weeds are the same thing so if a particular line of vegetables are, th are throwing up a whole lot of dandelion or dock root because it, it's compacted 
um, weeds go to what the soil requires in that similar feedback. So what you don't want is weeds to be competitors, but you do want the nutrients and minerals that they're fixing in the soil because the soil is crying out for it. Um, so what I do is gather up all the weeds of a row, mark on a bucket, put them in a bucket, fill it up with water for two weeks and make and stir it every now and again and make a weed tea concentrate and then I'll water that in along the row and then that uh, is like a completely localised fertiliser. We'll also do um, chicken manure um, uh, teas as well for, for enriched nitrogen but the weed teas are particularly for minerals and nutrients that those weeds are trying to put back into the soil. So, yeah. How much of your time is spent growing and yeah. weeding? Yeah, so Meg and I, when it's just the two of us, because we have lots of volunteers that come and learn from us, so that kind of slows us down because we're in a kind of informal teaching, yeah. but it also speeds up once we get the work going because there's more hands on deck. But if it's just us at home and uh, because homeschooling is a part of learning of, of this so we're homeschooling as well and and also community schooling other kids mm -hmm. in in these sorts of things so um but i say on average i spend an hour a day on energy retrieval and storing and processing and three hours of food so that's a four hour day and then the rest gets taken up with family matters and going fishing with a young kid who's tugging at you to get to the lake and throw a line in. So, um, yeah, but I, I would say it's, it's a four-hour working day. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering if you could uh, speak around the social aspects or the, and the psychological aspect um, and the balance between uh, the frugality and potentially the denial aspects and what they did potentially to your self-esteem. <laughs> to then what you're saying, or what I've been, I've been friends with Patrick, so I've mm. seen that the increased richness, and has that conversely brought about a guilt, that when you mm. come to the city, do you mm. now, it's, you know, was there a change in going, I don't, I'm not wearing carbon client, <laughs> to now coming yeah. to the city and going, you poor bastard. Well, well put. that's really well put, and I think, um, yeah, I mean, I never wore Calvin Klein. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, just on that, all, all of our clothes uh, are generally op shop clothes. There is that. There, I, I, I feel, um, I, f I mean, I, I feel very similar to Bill Mollison. He said, all the world's biggest structural problems can be fixed in a garden. Now, I'm not really into the one solution. I'm not at all into one solution. I'm not even really into models. I think it what permaculture uh, uh, enables is that each person and each household can have a dynamic response of their own making. So it's not like a, you know, a dogmatic order. It's not like uh, you know, a, you know, Marxism. It's not, it's not like even capitalism, where there is a sort of ideology of be the greatest competitor, otherwise you'll be a loser. Um, we're, in, we're, we're just social Darwinian and therefore competition is, is the main game and everyone else can, you know, down in the pile can, while we're scrambling up above people. You know, there, there are, in each sort of ism, um, whether it be religious or, or secular, um, there are sort of uh, top-down systemic um, uh, um, ideologies or concepts that actually create a lot of pain and suffering. So, yeah, so that's a long way of saying there is no one fix, there is no one solution. But I am on board with Bill Mollison in that the garden is a place of great solace, of healing, uh, where we can grow our food, where we can have relationships. And so when I come to the city and see the absence of gardens in people's lives, yes, I feel, I feel uh, not so much guilt, um, anymore, I, I feel just terribly sad for, 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 because what, I, what I've realised is possible um, and it's not a heroic story, that's the thing. The big masculine story of Technofix and the new economy and the new energy source that's going to save all our problems, 
that's, that's very big ego stuff, and the garden e composts the ego. You know, it really does, and I feel like that's where, uh, you know, our expulsion from the garden is our, you know, one of our biggest myths, and I feel like we need to attend to that. So when I say highly urbanised, built structures that are very anthropocentric, I, I feel great grief for, for that because that is the dominant culture. And when the dominant culture thinks that is normal, then the sorts of things that happen in the garden are, are kind of not... They're not busy enough. They're not loud enough. Mm. They're not uh, screaming for attention enough. And that the, the relationship in a garden or a forest ecology requires being with those biomes and, and being humble in them because so much more life is being lived in those environments. And so I feel that what permaculture does as a way back, even in an urban context, and David's book, Retro Suburbia, is how do we ecologically retrofit fit the suburbs? How do we ecologically re retrofit very human-centric environments uh, to include uh, our Earth others? Uh, I hope that answers, yeah. yeah. Just wanted to, a couple of things, actually, but I just want to add that it isn't just human you are. I've, I've read of, was it Persian um, peasants that actually um, had um, pigeon hives, I think they were, mm. in the middle of their fields mm. because these pigeons would go forage for kilometres around yeah. and then conveniently bring all those nutrients, process them in their guts and feed them right where they needed them. Mm. A very permaculture concept. Very, that very much so. All this work, yeah. putting all the nutrients right where you want yeah. them. All this. Yes. Yes. In, in, a bigger, in a bigger farm scenario, absolutely. So, so what I'm saying in that uh, suburban context is that we're the largest mammals in these little garden farms. Therefore, it makes sense to use our, our uh, mammalian waste products. Be, be, and, and also, if we know what's going into our bodies, um, we, we, know, we, we know we're going to be making good soil. Um, and so it, it's just, that's the feedback loop that um, permaculturalists talk about. Except feedback, <clears throat> except feedback is, you know, um, always being attuned to something that could go wrong in that handling of waste material, whether it be a rusty nail from a piece of salvaged wood that, you know, cuts you and you create, you know, you, you have a, an issue with tetanus, or whether it be not composting human waste properly and pathogens not doing it in, um, it's a very simple science, but if you don't get it right, it is potentially dangerous. Um, so the pathogens, particularly in the first 14 days, require good ecology to, to mitigate. And the reason why we're so terrified of human waste is that we built cities that if you defecate or you, uh, um, we on the streets, then it's it is going to be a problem because there's no biology to take away um, our wastes. There's no to, to, to process it. So it bakes in the sun and it becomes disease. And that's why in an urban context we've become so... Uh, this is what I'm talking about when I talk about technology. So it wasn't doctors that fixed the problems of pa plagues and pestilence of the early cities. It was uh, engineers um, moving waste around and water in and out and, you know, they're the ones that actually fixed human hygiene, well, <laughs> fixed, I say in inverted commas, because all we've got now is just massive amounts of um, human waste, often contaminated with uh, pharmaceuticals, going off into big industrial treatment plants and, and being put through a very highly chemicalised process. Um, and it's a huge, of course, a wet water issue in the driest inhabited continent on the earth. So just how that we're using drinking water to flush away our waste is, is an insanity, really. You know, it's a hard sell, though. You know, <laughs> it's, not, it's not very sexy to talk about human waste. Yes? In, in terms of dealing with uh, human waste, Surely, in the same way that it used to be taboo to use the water off our roofs yeah. in the city, of Greece, yes. Surely we can, even though it is a hard sell. Surely we can actually move yep. towards doing that 
and you've encapsulated that you, know, you have to do, you have the right ecology and deal with the pathogens, especially in the first 40 days. Mm. But if our technology mm. can't provide that in a way that everyone can do it safely, yeah, you know, yeah, and, you know, um, given all the other things that we yeah. think we can do with technology, surely we can do that. Sure. And yeah. then, uh, not only do we recoup the energy and the goodness yeah. from it in a safe way and, mm. and use it for our gardens and so on, but you can dismantle the entire sewage system mm. and actually will be financially better off as well mm. as in, in all the other ways. Yeah. So, yeah. so therefore, what, what, can, what can we do? What can I do? Well, I, th I think that I think that the way to sell it is to is to actually identify that we are a culture that's scared of our poo. You know, I mean, I think I think like even just to, I think the first thing is to fess up to that. Um, there are numerous ways of like all our toilets. We've got three human newer toilets, and they all cost under hundred dollars to build. Now you can get an EPA approved one, which I think started around ten thousand dollars. So that's that's a technology for very wealthy people. Uh, so um, I guess what I'm saying is that we are not going to see the changes required in our society at a grassroots level to meet the administrators and the political will halfway unless we actually respectfully and safely break rules. And because all the rules are inhibiting people from living a truly sustainable life. There are so many rules in place, particularly the more urbanized we are. And so the main thing is, is to do it well and not be a danger to yourself, your family, or your neighbors. That is, that's the critical thing. And so slowly, bit by bit, getting uh, an understanding of, of how it works. The Human Your Handbook is the Bible um, uh, it's an incredible read. It was written 20 years ago. Uh, it has all, um, all the information to handle human waste in a very simple, cheap, affordable to everyone system. The systems that the EPA approve is basically ending up with almost no waste uh, and, and that product is then taken away by a safe operator. So what we're saying is that one part nitrogen so a cup of poo <laughs> requires 30 parts carbon, and when you compost to that recipe, which is a classic sort of composting recipe, you actually start to produce good amounts of soil. So it's, you imagine the bird pooping out of the tree into the leaf litter. There's one poo there and 30 parts carbon, and then a wallaby comes along and poops there, and there's one part poo to 30 parts carbon being leaf litter. Um, that's how it's based. It's, it's a kind of biomimicry. That's how... So, and soil is made from that, but the current EPA approved systems, it's all about reducing the product in the first place. But in terms of actually making soil that can actually grow food in a closed loop system in small urban areas, uh, the bucket system, they're literally $50, $100 toilets um, you can build them for. And, and the only way our family can eat organic food is to grow it ourselves, because it, it's just, Unfortunately, the organics have become a second-class system, and that's what we're really... What, while the organic movement have been, and the artisan bread movement, etc., are at least returning some of these old knowledges that we've lost, and that's a service unto itself, in terms of every Australian being able to afford this, that's what we're on about. It's like, OK, yes, we come from privilege, but living at, at about 30000 a year most people can relate to that. It's just how much agency people have to find the knowledge. And really, it's knowledge reclamation uh, around composting, uh, soils, sowing, seed saving, fermenting, cellaring, all these things. And many, um, Meg is a passionate uh, fermenter, and she runs a free workshop once a month. I take, um, in fact, with Brett, we started the community gardens so people can get together with families and gard gardeners. And, and community gardens go up and down in ebbs and flow of energy. And we've just re recognised that over the last eight or nine years that um, sometimes they're looking a bit depleted. You know, at the moment, there's this new energy, new people come to town. There's a resurgence in, of interest. Um, 
and so it's it's pumping at the moment. Mm. So, uh, yes, we're grid connected. We've got a one kilo, kilowatt system. We have a fridge and a washing machine, two laptops. And there's something else, and one other appliance. We don't have any lights uh, at night. So as the sun comes down, we go down. We have a couple of solar low amber lights that have no blue light in them. So we're really trying to bring our sensors down to, to the circadian rhythm. Um, so very little electricity use. Uh, we've got one phone that we share uh, in the family, just one, one mobile phone. That, that's, so that's the other thing we do have to charge. Um, but yeah, just very low amount. So, and we put back what we capture in the one kilowatt system we put back onto the grid. So our energy bills a quarter are around $100. We do, in winter particularly, we have um, these little reading lights that clip on so we can move them around. And, and we also have keep bees and we make uh, beeswax candles. So the whole, the whole idea of that is that um, the absence of blue light enables the body to regulate its sleep patterns and that we evolved as a species in the equatorial band, which has roughly 12 hours of sunlight, 12 hours of darkness. On a different topic, um, what community exchange system do you use? Great question. OK, so um, I'll try and keep this um, brief, because it is a bit of a big story. So David Graber, in his book, Debt, the First 5,000 Years, speaks about three forms of economy. The first one is strain at the economy for strangers and enemies, which money really suits, because there's no relationship or nuanced social engagement required. So strangers and enemies is money. The second one is formal forms of barter. Now that uh, is not quite trusted. It may be in the community, because you, you usually barter with people that are in some sort of, uh, you, you're close by, or it might be traveling, but you, there isn't an explicit trust yet, so you set up a formal uh, barter system. The third one is the flow of gifts economy, and that's the, that's the one that we are most excited about, and the, the one which is unregistered flow of gifts. So you, with probably 80 people in the town constituting about 35 households, um, we're constantly exchanging, you know, whether it be children's clothes, hand-me-downs, to produce, to skill sharing, to some form of, you know, it might be childminding or s some sort of knowledge sharing, uh, anything, it could be anything. Uh, and that is the most dynamic and that's the most giving of the economies um, and nurturing of the economies. So. Is that with an online system? Yes, in, in a sense, it does engage with an online system. There are things uh, in our community, uh, or for example, when a, a family has a, a child, or there's been a, a, an accident in the family, or there's cancer, or some sort of crisis has happened, uh, there's a meal tree that is established on usually a Facebook page or a Google Doc. And a meal tree might be, when, when uh, Woody Blackwood, our youngest was born, we had 60 days of meals, of the evening meal being brought to us. So you, you put down on a, on a list online uh, which date you, you will cook for that family. And of course, it's one of the things we love to do because of that unregistered flow of gifts. And so when a family is, as I said, suffering or celebrating a new child and is you know um, needing support, the, the meal tree is, is just you know, one example of many. And again, that's more informal. Yeah, so the middle, the middle economy we have the least to do with because when you're having, like Let's system, for example, um, it's another whole accounting system. And it's like, well, while it's a great transition between strangers and enemies economy of the money, monetary economy to the flow of gifts, and there has to be an in, in, intermediate because you're not quite ready to be tr trusting, say, 
a person you haven't had much to do with and you don't want to just sort of go over there and spend a day in their garden transforming it and then we never see them again. Um, you know, because that... The, or or uh, the reverse might be true too. They might be entering into a gift exchange with us and they don't quite know who we are uh, or, or I'll speak for myself, um, you know, if what I've got to offer is any good or any value. So... Um, Usually, there's something formally set up, like, yes, I'll teach you how to uh, use um, WordPress. Uh, I'll give you a blogging lesson for two hours uh, if, in exchange, you weed in our garden with me for two hours. So that might be... That's, so that's a formal exchange of two hours equals two hours. Mm. And that, that is handy in establishing trust. because um, And that builds relationships, and then hopefully that middle economy moves to the unregistered flow of gifts, which is so efficient because it's based on trust. And trust gets broken from time to time, so you might just reel back a little bit and you might, you might have been tr trading with someone in an unregistered form, but then you've sort of felt you might be a bit burnt. So you might just say, oh, yeah, if, if, if a request to, uh, to engage in some sort of economic exchange happens again, you might just say, oh, well, I tell you what, why don't we... Um, why don't I come over to do that? Uh, and what I would like from you is this. So it's re-establishing just a more formal thing because you might have felt a little duped. So it's, it's no wonder that the monetary economy is so, you know, so well used because you don't have to think about it. You don't have to have relationships. Um, you, you can really just, those bag of carrots, five bucks, yep, cheers, see you later. That was really fascinating. Thanks, Thank mate. you so Cheers. much. Thank you. Um,